frightening, scary, wonder if you're going to be alive the next morning. That's about the description of the jump itself. I joined the Army, March, my part of the service, September 1942, because they had something that I wanted. There was a specialty outfit that they just designed called the Experimental Unit 506 Parachute Infantry, something brand new at the time. I was looking for something different. I didn't want to be drafted. In the newspaper and magazines, this new unit being formed, Parachute Infantry Unit. It looked very interesting, and it was for me. I said, okay, I'm going to try it. So I went over to Fort Monroe. Fort Monroe was the Army headquarters at that time. The Pentagon was built but not occupied, just finished. When I got over to Fort Monroe, they explained it to me, what was going on. And uh, they said I had to be 20 years old. I was only 19. Had to have my mother sign. So uh, one of the guys said, where's your mother? I said, well, it so happens that she's in the car. He said, all you got to do is get her to sign it, and you're in. Of course, my mother wasn't in the car. She was home. And neither did about 1,000 others in my same position. Their mother signed it as well, <laughs> like me. So I signed it. I joined the 506 Parachute Infantry, strictly an experimental unit. 7,000 people qualified for it, 7,000. They only needed 2,500. So then the picking started. They had to get doing it down to 2,500. And they put us through the worst you could possibly think of to, to, to uh, weed us out, which they did. They came up with 2,500 of the finest men in the country. Frightening, scary, wonder if you're going to be alive the next morning. That's about the description of the jump itself. What happened was, I wasn't supposed to be on that plane, but because of a writer, a British writer from uh, the uh, Associated Press, took my seat in the plane that I was supposed to be on, and I had to go to a different airplane at the last minute not knowing what the hell I was going to do. I didn't know anybody there. Finally, I got my seat, sat in the plane. Everything was very quiet, naturally. Everybody was in his own thoughts. Finally, when the red light went on, time for me to jump, the man in front of me slipped on the floor. I had to help him up to get up with all the stuff he had. He had about 150, 200 pounds of material on him besides his weight. Got him on his feet, hooked up, got him out the door. By that time, I know where the hell I was. No one else did. Jumped out of the plane, and it seemed like it took me a half hour to get down. We actually was about 50 minutes from plane to the ground, but I never did land on the ground. I landed in a bunch of cows in a barn. Later on, I found out it was the Carnation Milk Company barn, and they were cows being ready to be shipped to Germany, prize cows from Normandy. I got myself together, scared to death, of course, not knowing where I was, had no idea because I was supposed to. I was an operations sergeant. I made the sand tables for the jump so people would know where they were when they got on the ground. 
things scattered around so bad, nobody, only one plane, hit the ground where it was supposed to be. That was number one plane that I was supposed to be on. And on that plane, everybody on that plane was either captured or murdered, including my battalion commander. Finally, I decided I had to get out to where I was. I didn't know where I was, had no idea. Had I known then that what I know now, I wouldn't be here because I would have dropped dead from a heart faint because I was in a town called Carrington, which I notified my people on the sand table to absolutely avoid at all costs because of a heavy concentration of enemy in that town. I didn't find out till about 10 minutes later when I finally picked up about six, eight men and I told them, I said, look, I have an idea where to go, but I have no idea where I am. No one else did. And they were scared to death. Of course, I wasn't exactly happy, but at least I had my senses about it. I was supposed to be the operations sergeant, so I was supposed to know something. So finally, I said to the man, I said, look, all we're doing is just heading in the direction that I think. I said, what we ought to do is stop by one of these farmhouses. I said, this is a norm it's in Normandy. And I said, these people know the ground. They know where they are. They're the smartest farmers in the world. Let's find out from them to tell us where we are exactly. They said, okay, of course they would do, agree anything that I wanted at that time because they were really scared to death. I wasn't exactly happy. Finally, we came to this small farm house, knocked on the door, firing everywhere. Ack, ack, fair. Stuff in the, in, the, in the air, on the ground. The farmer and his wife came to the door. She started screaming. I grabbed her by the face, put, a hand on, put my hand on her mouth, put her down on the floor, got him down on the floor, and I told him what little words that I knew, direction, French directions. He understood, and I told him it was the uh, invasion, invasion. So he understood with all this noise going around him. So opened up the maps underneath a raincoat with a flashlight, and I said to him, pointing out on the map, I said, St. Mary Glace, that was a town near where we were supposed to land. And he said, we, oui. and he pointed this way. I said, St. Mary Glace, we. Oui. St. Calm de Mont, we. Oui. Now move the map around a little bit to orient it. Got to two more places. Finally, I said, Carrington. And he knocked on the ground. Bing, bing, bing. He said, we, oui, Carrington. So I yelled at him. I said, Carrington, Carrington. He said, we, we, we on the ground. So then I realized he was telling me that we landed in Carrington, which scared the living hell out of me right then and there. So I told the guys, I said, let's get the hell out of here right now. I know where I am. So we got out of there. We headed direction of the bridges where we were supposed to have our mission. And we were about five miles away so I, that picked up about 21 men total, and all of them scared to death. Of course, I wasn't exactly happy. I didn't want to show them that I was scared to death as well, so I did a pretty good job. And finally, we picked up an officer, a captain. So I said, Captain, I said, fine. Told him where we were. And I said, take over. He said, no, no. He said, you look like you know what you're doing. You, I'll follow you. 
So I had a captain and 21 other enlisted men to take to the bridges. On the way to the bridges, we, st we were stopped in the middle of the woods. It was the headquarter, the headquarter company of the 502nd, Colonel Johnson. He was the commanding officer. And he said to me, he said, Shames, oh, he said, Sergeant, he said, do you know where the hell you are? I said, yes, sir. I know exactly where I am. He said, show me. So I showed him on the map, and he took, he had about, Eight of his men in my group, he took them with him. So we kept going, going, going. Finally, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I ended up at the two bridges that was our mission. And when I got to the bridges, Captain Shettle, my boss, was there waiting. Instead of the battalion, we had 117 men plus the 18 that I brought. So the first thing he told me, he says, incidentally, I'm supposed to tell you something if I see fit. He said, you are now a lieutenant. Market Gordon, as far as the 101st Airborne Division and the 82nd Airborne Division was concerned, was a success. The big failure was the British. The idea was to open up a corridor parallel to the Rhine from Belgium all the way up to Arnhem, Netherlands, where the bridge cro crossed the uh, uh, Rhine. The idea was to keep the roads open 100 miles from Belgium all the way up to Arnhem. The 82nd Airborne Division and 101st kept the roads open. The British were supposed to plunge through with their tanks and move. But they forgot something. They forgot they'd stop tea. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they had to stop for tea. It don't make any difference where they were. So consequently, they were cut off. We did our job. We collect, we, uh, our mission was successful. They lost the whole division. We came back from Holland after 72 days of fighting, 72 straight days on the battlefield, a record by the United States Army. We were relieved to go back to France to rest, relaxation, all in all. We went back to France to a place that was 100 miles from Paris. All we could think about was the fact that we were going to Paris. That's all we could think about, because I hadn't had leave since April. And this is now December. So I was the first one on the list. List came out, people going to Paris, 72 hours in Paris. First name on the top of the list was Lieutenant James. He was a motor pool officer taking two trucks to Paris. Uh, 36 men, two officers, me and another officer. I was the convoy commander, big deal, two, con two, two trucks. Now we were in the Champagne district of France. You could buy champagne f for a pack of cigarettes. Cigarettes cost us 50 cents a carton. That's five cents a pack. So we had plenty of champagne. First time I'd ever had champagne in my life. I still love it. <laughs> Anyhow, the time came about around December the 15th, 16th, 
and we were listening to the radio, and the German had a breakthrough north of where we were, in the Ardennes of Belgium. But it didn't bother us because we were going to Paris, and we had plenty of money. I had a roll of money with choke a horse, and I was going to blow it all in Paris for three days. Waited for December the 17th. That was the day that we were going to load up those trucks at 7 o'clock in the morning and head to Paris, 100 miles. Loaded the trucks up, got 10 miles outside of where we were. The truck driver next to me says, Lieutenant, there's a MP on a motorcycle telling us to pull over. I said, the hell with him. I said, we're going to Paris. I said, somebody's playing a joke on me. Because I was a new man, new officer of the whole unit, and they all played jokes on me. I said, the hell with him, let's go. He said, sir, that's a captain on that motorcycle. I said, you kidding? He said, no, sir. So I looked out the window. Sure enough, there was a captain. I pulled over. I got out of the truck. I said, what the hell's going on? He said, turn these trucks around. You've been recalled to going up north in Belgium. No, no where, but you call. Your, 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 your unit is being loaded as we talk. You're not going to have time to do anything but change clothes and get on those trucks. That took care of Paris right then and there. Not only that, I was on a brand new uniform I'd never worn it. I'd worn it one time when I tried it on, and I looked like a, 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 a gypsy with that beautiful uniform all shined up. When I got to camp, I was told don't change anything, put on my coveralls, get any jacket you can find because all of our heavy stuff was turned in because we'd been in field for 77 days. It was all worn up, all of our material, everything, weapons and everything else. You don't have time to do anything. Just grab your weapon, get what ammunition you can, and get on those flat bottom trucks. That's what we did. Where we were going had no idea in the world. We know we were going north to Belgium. Got out of the trucks, had no idea where we were, Somebody saw an old beat up, bent up sign that said Bastogne. Had no idea what Bastogne was, never heard of it. That's where we stayed until January the 21st. And we held off 180,000 Germans and there were 18,000 of us heading to Berchtesgaden. Went to the head of the line, told by Colonel Sink, he said, you're going to be the first one in Birch's Garden. He said, you're going to be the first one in Eagle's Nest with your platoon. So I said, fine. I didn't know what the hell Eagle's Nest was. But when we got there, of course, it was magnificent. And they had everything in the world. They had all the whiskey you could possibly drink all the food that you could possibly eat. And I told my men, I said, okay, I didn't allow you to loot while you were in Belgium or Holland or France. I said, now you're in Germany, it's yours. Take anything you want except the innocent life. I said, if you come across any of the SS people, they'll give you in a hard time shoot the bastards, and they did. So we got to the eagle's nest. There we had everything we wanted. We looked around, and we looked at the automobile uh, garage. There were about four or five of these large limousines, Mercedes limousines. So uh, I figured I'd like to have one of them. So my men got one for me to ride around in, and I was riding around 
Bertha's garden in that Hitler's uh, limousine. So finally, Colonel Sink found out about it, and he got raised hell. He called me and said, get rid of that damn call. He said, you got no business with it. And I said, yes, sir. I had it about three or four days. So I said, what should I do with it? He said, I don't give a damn what you do with it. Get rid of it. So I talked to my number two man. I said, I got an idea. I said, we're right in front of what I call Gross Glockner. Gross Glockner, big mountain. I said, let's go up to the mountain a little ways. I said, I went up there the other day, take a look around as uh, overlook. I said, I want to do something with that overlook. So we went up there with the with the with the with the Hitler's automobiles, got out the car, got to the edge of the overlook, and pushed it off, went down about three thousand feet. <laughs> that was the end of that automobile. I noticed the guys first went for the silverware and all the other good stuff, and I asked one of the people working there, uh, a Hollander. I said, where's the whiskey? He said, down below. I said, let's go down and take a look at it. So we went down, and there was, and there were those two bottles of cognac label on it for the first use only. I grabbed those two, and that's all I wanted. And I, I, I kept one and gave the other one to Colonel Singh. And I brought it home. I knew that it was worth something, just the idea. And I did just didn't want to drink, because everybody drank everything they could possibly get their hands on at the, at the eagle's nest. They drank it dry. My two bottles were left. Gave one to sink. I brought one home. And of course, I kept it. And at Steve's Bar Mitzvah, I decided to open it up and drink it there, which I did. And we did. We had a, I, a lot of my buddies there, a lot of my army buddies. And of course, after we got through, we threw the bottle away. So somebody asked me about, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. What happened to the bottle? I said, the bottle? I said, We've, we drank it. What happened to the empty bottle? I said, I threw it away. Threw it away? I said, that's right. He said, you have an idea what that would be worth today? I said, yeah, two cents, I guess. He said, at least $10,000.